good day i will uh, please uh, the the questions you have mark them down as i speak and this session at maybe at 40 minutes we'll take 15 minutes for questions completely i am at slide number 43 poga explaining the concept of poga so poga is a hebrew verb as i said it's first used in joshua 16:6 in quartering taking over territory and dividing between what is god's and what is the enemy's so this was conquest of uh, canaan and during the conquest of canaan joshua 16:6 then the border fell westward at mikmeta on the north and the border fell eastward to tanath shilo so this border fell is the word is the hebrew verb poga so when uh, when so border fell meaning they took it forcefully you, you they took it forcefully from the enemy so this side of the border was the lord's property that side of the border was still in enemy hand so this is the concept of poga when our iniquity was poga on jesus christ as isaiah 53 6 so in his life his life became the battle line where darkness lost to light so his life became the battle line so the cross was poga our iniquity was laid upon him and he took over all our lions all our iniquities and won it for god by the blood so poga has the sense where iniquity jesus christ took the iniquity of nations of persons of family lines of business lines of wealth lines he, jesus christ took the iniquity of all nations he sprinkled with his blood and uh, that is isaiah 52 15 and he took the iniquity line upon himself and he won it for god this is the purpose of intercession uh, so uh, in intercession the interse- so the word intercede he interceded means he got pogard so the intercessor uh, intercede uh, the hebrew verb verb behind intercede is poga it means uh, the t- taking over the iniquity and the authority over it and defeating it in our prayers did i make myself clear so the intercessor does the poga comes in between meet uh, so jesus came between came in between enemy lines and took over to god jesus came between and met with god's wrath and sinful man so i told you cross was jesus getting stretched between god's righteousness and man's iniquity jesus got stretched and he died but he he uh, rose victorious between satan wages and sinful man on the uh, on the cross satan's head was crushed we have to do the same when we pray for people city or nation we come between so the intercessor does identificational repentance and takes over the iniquity and the sin transgression and trespass of their nation in prayer and take it to the lord in prayer you do many many take we say lord we have numbered lord we have measured our sin is terrible our sin deserves death but jesus christ took that sin we pray like this for our husband we pray like this for our son and daughter we never right wrongs w r i t e we right wrongs r i g h t that is the mode of the intercessor now you can put that down for any more questions uh next slide Uh, poga has the uh, concept of cause to alight our prayers can alight on intended prayer targets uh, 
people, city and nations, our prayers alight, uh, strike the mark. Our prayers strike the mark. So we are not desperate. When we pray, the Lord takes our prayers. Some of it he is collecting in a golden bowl in heaven. Uh, Revelation 8.5 When the bowl is full, he tills over and then there are results on earth. So we know our, intercess, our prayers are being gathered. Then uh, point number three, our iniquity was laid on Jesus, fell violently. Uh, he bore our sin. These are some aspects of the application of the word uh, poga. Uh, next slide is also about poga. Mark the boundary. Extend the kingdom of Christ into new territories through prayer. We take the example from Joshua 16, 6. Plead on behalf of Jeremiah 30, 15. Confront the enemy. Uh, there are different scriptures for different applications. <coughs> excuse me, of the word poga in prayer practice. Do you want to ask any questions on poga? Or... I'll continue with the next slide then. Keys of the kingdom, royal scepter and shepherd staff. So in our nation, we always monitor the gates of Hades. How are Hades working? At present, there is a big battle between the government and the underworld. Our underworld and uh, drug peddling had become a huge problem. We had become a, a trading center for heroin and hard drugs because we are all surrounded by the sea. And our jailers and prison system has become very corrupt. Uh, so now there is a big battle going on. Then we constantly pray for other things of governance. We watch for Haman, people who can become animus towards the church. Uh, so uh, any other, uh, of course, during our terrorism days, we had to constantly watch that issue. Uh, then we watch how the new generation of young Tamil students in universities are getting uh, impatient, they, they feel as if the central government is not doing anything. So we pray on that, they are getting militant. We pray that our government becomes sensitive to that. So we have to rally both the Sinhala community and the Tamil community to see each other's perspective. Church is common ground, church is middle ground, church is the intercessor, intercessor stands in the gap. He's not on that side or he's not on this side. Intercessor stops the breach, repairs the wall. So you know Ezekiel 22, 30, God looked for a man. And when he looks for a man in your cities, I hope God will be able to say, I found a man. I've, uh, and God looks for a man and often he finds a woman, but that's okay. Uh, but let the husband be kinsman, redeem it to the wife. We monitor gates of Hades. We watch the Hamans. Then we look for Daniel, Joseph, Mordecai and Nehemiah. They are all in different royal positions. During the time of the exile, 586 BC, Daniel was in the palace with Nebuchadnezzar. Ezekiel was by the river Kiba with the exiles seeing visions of glory. Jeremiah was with the backslidden church in Jerusalem, suffering for giving his prophecies. Uh, if you had an option, where do you like to be? King's palace, with the exiles who have fled their country, or with the backslidden church back in Jerusalem? Where do you like to be? The correct answer is, it's not your choice. God chose each one according to what God put into them. So we say with Christ, John 15, 13, Lord, I didn't choose myself. You chose, chose it for me. Uh, help me, equip me, enable me. So Daniel will work with 
at high stakes, heavenly watches, and with the king himself. Uh, at present, our believer and our friend, uh, believer in the church, our friend, the former commander of the Air Force, is the governor of the Western province. It's a significant place, and he has to constantly mind the Lord and do his business with the Lord. Uh, otherwise, people elevated to high office, forget God, forget church. They think they got a, they can think, they got a platform for themselves. It's not a platform for themselves, it's a platform for God's business. So, uh, Daniel is a, a risky thing because kings are moody. So, you know, he gets into the lion's den and things like that. Uh, but God equips a person. Joseph, we know, is a anointing and a calling for storehouses. So this is a time that uh, God's people need to be in all the storehouses God has in that nation to make a nation prosperous. So in a post-COVID world, I'm suggesting church will be the vanguard in prosperity and economic recovery. Don't look at your government and say, government is not getting it right. You better get it right. You better be the government. You better be the voice. You better get wisdom. Uh, so our president has divided the nation's resources, exportable, uh, earning resources or manufacturing resources, into 40 state ministries. Uh, so we want to work with all 40. We want to pray, raise up, silver doors for those uh, pr pr produce of Sri Lanka. Some you know already, tea, coconut, rubber, garments, fisheries. Uh, so we want God to raise up 40 different people, very knowledgeable in their field, working closely with the government, giving such insight and wisdom, uh, government feel that Christians are vitally contributing. So this is what... Uh, we are hoping that our government will be blessed by the effort of the church. Uh, that's Joseph working with the storehouses. So you know Malachi 3.10, I will open the windows of heaven. And we have this long-term thought that uh, a na nations, one-tenth of nation's GDP will come into the church as tithe. Suppose you, uh, uh, suppose uh, America, uh, Malaysia's wealth turnover is one trillion. Uh, we are saying, let hundred uh, one tenth would be hundred billion come to the church as tithe. One tenth somehow that such massive entrepreneurs will be turned to Christ. One-tenth come to Christ uh, from a massive uh, income. One-tenth come to Christ, come under the uh, sanctity by as offerings to God's house. Then such a nation will prosper. This may be how North, uh, South Korea prospered. Samsung was founded by a Christian who are, uh, who, who Hyundai was founded by a Christian. They later sold them, but they were begun by Christians and they prospered. So that's a little storehouse model that Joseph's in every nation arise at this time with business wisdom, speculative ability, imagination, futuristic. Then Mordecai is a king's gatekeeper, humble, middle management position but very vital for a king, came to be trusted and got promoted as uh, second in, next to the king. He also got promoted. Then Nehemiah is a very humble position, serving before the king in a personal manner. A gecko in the king's house and he, he was used by God to rebuild Jerusalem. Uh, we are shepherds in all the fields. So we have a royal scepter and a shepherd staff. Royal scepter is the authority we wield. A shepherd staff is the uh, is the 
uh, pastoral uh, pastoral calling or the place where we work. So even a Christian chairman has to have a royal scepter and a pastoral shepherd staff. Of course, this work for the full-time minister, uh, he himself is has kingly authority over demons, devils and other situations and he also has the shepherd staff. So often I like to think the king came and he, when he died on the cross, the scepter of Jesus and the shepherd staff of Jesus were both invested in us and in, our, in his resurrection life in us, we have the scepter and the staff. A scepter works like a king, staff works like a shepherd. Uh, so we don't take kingship into our head. Uh, we, because our king, king of kings is meek and lowly. Zechariah 12, 11 says, See the king of kings, uh, Zechariah, uh, Zechariah 10, 9, how the king of kings comes lowly on an ass. So our king is lowly. So we take it from Matthew chapter 5. The poor in spirit, theirs will be the kingdom of God. That Greek word for poor means uh, very cringing, very needy. When we are needy in spirit, God's kingdom works for us. The meek shall rule earth. That is Psalm 37 also. Meek shall rule earth. Then uh, uh, the morning shall be comforted. So these are all attitude of intercessors. When the kingdom authority is wielded through people with that kind of character. Blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the, they shall be called the Son of God. And they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. These are like qualifications or character attributes of those who wield the scepter. And the shepherd's staff gets done. Uh, so I hope it's uh, the Sermon on the Mount gives us the character style of kingdom advances uh, and how we pray our governor nation. Uh, any bad thing is a cause for mourning. Godly sorrow, 2, 2 Corinthians 7.10. God, so when our government does wrong, we go into godly sorrow and we don't go on the social media, placarding everybody, saying government has done this wrong, calling names and he's a moron and what not. Uh, our social media gets very insolent. I'm sure I saw uh, Malaysian Christians on social media during uh, election time. Pretty bad. Uh, so we are not uh, uh, we are not to be that. We are to be mournful that God's comfort will come to our nations. If we go to protest, rage, what we sow we get. We will also have protest and rage and rebellion in our households. So. A lot of younger generation are in rage and protest. We don't want to increase that. We don't want to feed that. Uh, so we have to mind that whatever we do in our generation, it will have a... Uh, uh, the law of Newton will be applied. There will there'll be an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, then we have already looked at the prayer clock, you remember? Uh, we did it for three hour slots, waking up in the morning, Every three hours, we give a social emphasis. Uh, six to nine in the morning, schools. Nine to uh, twelve, government. Twelve afternoon to three p.m., business like that. Every three hours, we keep it in our head or keep it in our time schedule. Even we are at work, a housewife at home, uh, traveling. During those three hours, we at least offer a five-minute prayer. Uh, in that relevant quarter in that relevant section. That's what the prayer clock is, to keep prayer clocking, ticking, tick-tocking uh, inside the Christian. Yes, this is not about the TikTok app, but prayer tick-tocking inside the Christian. Then prayer week, we did seven brigades and seven sheaves, the timetable for the week. Then the monthly prayer parliament is the thing that we were led to do from 2000 four and every month at a time like this like today 
about 70 of our pastors are gathered from all over the country, Sinhalese and Tamil together, holding the nation before God's face, prophesying, praying, uh, reading the scriptures together, prophetic actions. It's very intense. We start at 5 in the morning and we go on till about 10, 11 in the night. Uh, lots of Ceylon tea helps in that. That's the monthly prayer parliament. There's one thing I have not mentioned in this slide. Maybe it's there in another slide. Uh, that is uh, uh, the ladies do a kingdom ladies business meeting. Every Thursday, Hiranti has done it with some ladies. Now for years, they form a shadow cabinet. And every week, they take up in prayer uh, what has happened during the week. It's about what, do, what I mean by prayer governance is it's not a prayer for their personal need. It's a prayer for the nation's needs, city's needs, government needs. So it's prayer beyond our personal need that rules the nation. Uh, do you want to ask questions at this time? Or? Do you want to ask questions at this time? What happens if no man in prayer meeting? No man. Did I see it right? If there is no man in the prayer meeting? Was that the question? If I understood it right, if, if, if no man comes to the prayer meeting, don't give him his next day lunch or dinner. No, that's just a joke. Somehow, pastor has to get men involved in prayer. One thing, it's a two or three agreement for every household. Every household is God's forward defense line along with the church. So church and home work very closely together. I call it God's forward defense line. Any other questions? Uh, shall we take some questions now or...? Or go for some more time and take questions. Uh, if anyone has questions, you know, you may ask now, you know, to doctor. We, we are going into a new area about uh, eschatology and uh, revelation. That's why I thought may, maybe we'll take some. I can see some questions popping up, but not long enough for me to read through. Is every Christian called to be an intercessor? Yes, of course. By definition, Christian uh, stands between light and darkness, isn't it? So you have to at least intercede for your, your, your causes, your boss, your family, your child. Start with the family always and increase your boundary from where you... Uh, you can't afford the luxury of not praying. Intercession is praying beyond yourself. Every Christian must. Some may give themselves to prayer long hours, but every Christian must. The pastor must be the head intercessor. He, 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 he has no right to be pastor if he is not praying. Yeah. Uh, I love to pray. Uh, I miss that. Any, uh, I'll, am I to carry on if no questions? Elaborate on choosing grounds oh, of prayer. Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Oh. Pardon? Sorry. Okay. You know, there's a, you know, there's a question. I love to pray to form meeting in my home, but my husband just say I can lead. So what can I do? I can't. There's you like to have a prayer meeting in here? All right, dear Nina, can you just explain? Uh, oh, good mo good, uh, good, good, good. <laughs> good afternoon. I just actually, I love prayer meeting. Even the prophet say I'm an intercessor, but I love to pray even alone. But the problem is, my husband always say, "Oh, you can lead them. You can lead them." So. What can I do after I learn this about the kinship, the boys anointing, all this sort of thing? I have to have a lot of questions. How to so what get your 
how to get your husband to pray, is it? He loved, he, he prayed, but he only prayed five minutes. But me, I like to pray like what you say, you know, like go on, you know, like present of the Holy Spirit, you know. I, I love to pray even when I was, I, I was continuing. But him, he just joined in five minutes and go away. <laughs> yeah, his pastor will have to educate him on it. Don't be your husband's pastor, it's too much of a task. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, pastors have to encourage men to pray and uh, show them that it is a great, good investment. Prayer is a good investment. Without prayer, we have a lot of dust, thorns, wounds, serpent. You know what? The Garden of Eden goes wrong without prayer. Now, please. Yes. Um, it's, it's okay for the woman to be stronger in prayer, isn't it? As long as the, as long as she and the husband is uh, is agreeable or, or understand this uh, uh, this relationship, for the lead, for the woman to be stronger and leading in prayer. Uh, Ron, if we concede to that, uh, when husband is meant to be the leader. He has to lead in vital areas, reading the word he has to be leader, uh, earning his finances he has to be leader, mistake management he has to be the leader, you can't leave it to your wife to manage the mistakes of your children. So prayer he has to be the leader. Uh, how long one prays, obviously if wife is at home, she may have more time to pray. But prayer is too important a thing for man not to lead. Prayer being so important, man must lead. Uh, I think the churches have to have a connect prayer with the work realm. Now, no husband can expect wife to pray for his workplace, isn't it? And work is so much a part of man, he leaves home at 6.30 or 7, comes home at 7. So those 12 hours, if he doesn't pray for his work, who is going to pray for his work? And if a man is involved in work for 12 hours and he has no sense of leading that prayer, uh, work fields will be run by prayerless, godless people, isn't it? Maybe church has to formulate a new vision for prayer in a post-COVID world where the man has to lead prayer effectively for work's sake, finances sake, other health sake, you know what I mean? I, 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 am, I, am, I, be, I, am, I will know that uh, ladies pray more, but this is a season we have to get men to lead in prayer. I am not saying ladies leading is not effective. Post-Covid world may need a greater impetus, a masculine impetus into prayer. That's... Uh, that, shall we sort of... Uh, Encourage our men to pray, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Jesus said, Luke 18, men ought to pray. At least let that be an incentive for men to pray. Yeah. Shall I continue then? Okay, there's another question. Yes. Uh, elaborate on choosing grounds of prayer. Yeah. G grounds of prayer involves two aspects what you pray for, content of prayer. So you pray for husband's well-being, wife, marriage, children's future, your family finances, family health. Then you pray for cleansing by the blood of iniquitous lines that may come to your family. So those are... Uh, so content of prayer. Other grounds of prayer meaning praying by the blood of Jesus, praying with the word, Praying completely in the power of the Holy Spirit, releasing the anointing in prayer, praying with prophetic actions, uh, then praying uh, for a government on the basis of what good the government can do, prophesying the intention of governance into prayer. Did you understand? Did you sort of? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have another question, and this is from you know, Reverend Yu Hong Singh. 
Yes. The chairman of the Tungling Seminary, he said, in some culture, women are in control. Example, in some Asian cultures, women control the finances. The husband receives allowance from their wives. So what do you do in a situation like this? Uh, if, if, if in a home, uh, this must be some Chinese culture. In, in, in Sri Lanka, the husband dominates quite a bit. Same in India, I think. I think this is about very successful Chinese businesswomen. Uh, yeah, thing is this, you now traditionally we know that we, uh, ladies in the church pray. I am I'm asking for a push that church makes prayer attractive to men and mandatory also, that tell them, you know, your work fields can't go on without prayer. Home also can't go on without prayer of a father. So a lot of homes, thorny things are pushed on the mother most unfairly. Mistake management needs the head of the home to sit down. So I, I, I lecture on this, every, every time I lecture I say, mother makes it safe within the boundary. Father sets up the boundary. When boundaries are violated and mistakes happen, it is the father who must sit, sit with the son or daughter and have a nice long discussion. Every mistake time is father investment time. Let me repeat it. Every mistake time is time to, for dad to invest in your son and in your daughter. And up to the age of four, mother's influence is more than father's. But from four onwards, father has to interact with the child to give confidence, competence and certainty in things. Then passing 14, they look to their peers. Then when they, so your dad and mom must be, dad has to be in their life before 14. If not, they go berserk and you can't get them back. Their morals and digital life will be so so, so wrong. Then again, when they are going through 18, they have a father window looking for the father for career guidance, curricular guidance. Then father strongly has to come in there with prayer and so on. So there are, uh, there is a sociological pattern that humanity is designed with. Uh, so father has to be there and he has to lead with prayer and there is no there's no gainsaying or there's no option out of it, isn't it? Okay, there's another question posted earlier. Yes. Example, do the same group of people pray in every brigade every day or will there be a different sets of people with different prayer burdens stationed in life praying for the different categories, different days, which will be more effective? Uh, good question. For instance, mothering brigade, obviously mothers will get onto it better. Then some people f have teen children, then they know the pressures of teen children and they will pray better. Then for treasure, uh, Thursday on treasure, businessmen will understand that thing better, isn't it? Uh, so each of those prayer brigades, obviously some people will feel more into those things. Uh, so it, it can. Everybody needs to pray for each of those with understanding because it involves your family health, family marriage, your family finances. But uh, some will be more uh, knowledgeable, led to more directed prayer in a given regard. Mm. Yeah. Okay. One last question. Then you can continue your lecture. Will giving my best to my career in terms of time and effort with the objective of honouring God be considered as serving in the marketplace and not just deemed as secular work. And in doing so, I might not have the hours to channel to church as required. Repeat it, please. Would giving my best to my career in terms of time and effort with the objective of honouring God be considered as serving in the marketplace 
and not just deemed as secular work. And in doing so, I might not have the hours to channel to church as required. This person saying, you know, they are in the career, they want to do best yeah, in the career yeah. with the objective of honoring God, serving God. Uh, in doing so, this person may not have hours to channel to church as required. Uh, so, uh, serving God in the marketplace is firstly witnessing about Christ. There's no option out of each reach one. Uh, so, any Christian is required to do the Great Commission of witnessing to your oikos, near the, your contact world. So, you have to witness to your boss, witness to your colleagues, witness to your juniors. You have to, you are in the workplace for the Great Commission. You are in the workplace to tell them about Christ. So, lunch time, a little earlier. So, um, I think in Malaysia, lunch time alpha is quite quite popular and then and then soon after work get a little time you have to redeem time for eternal purposes that you growing in your career and earning money gives no glory to God unless God is spoken in it so this is a I feel this is a big flip out that Christian businessmen take their pleasure in earning money having power and growing in their career, they try to equate that with serving God. You are serving yourself. You may be even faithful in giving money to God. But in the first place, you are in the workplace to witness to Christ. Have you done that? Have you, have you brought someone to Christ? Then your, your whole life is about discipling others for Christ. Work, you are in a work field because nobody else is in that work field. If I, am work, if I am in the hospital, no one else is in the hospital, I am the Christian in the hospital. So when I was working in the ward or I was lecturing in the medical faculty, I had a very busy schedule. I was professor's registrar. I had to do research, I had to do ward work, I had to do... I had to do... Uh, uh, teach medical students. I had to keep touch with research. I sleep sometimes at three o'clock in the morning because I have to do a professor's research also. I had to be do co-publisher. Still, we had a very active church life as well as witnessing while I'm at work as much as possible. So, since I have been there and I know how stretched medical academics is, yet how much time you can redeem if you have a will. So I don't buy into this theory that my career, my money making, my power display, my importance takes all my time is a heresy. It's a heresy. No Christian should be allowed to get away with this false teaching. <clears throat> now, Pastors can feel intimidated in speaking to university professors, doctors, lawyers or businessmen who are very successful about their practical Christian life. Uh, so pastors have to equip themselves with the honor of God and dignity of God to be able to speak to big time people, tell them nothing, nothing is bigger than God. You doing your career, I mean we don't have to be offensive. But we must have a mission philosophy. People getting prosperous, doing their career, climbing up the ladder is not in itself God-honoring. God-honoring is one soul to Christ changes darkness to light. And you discipling that person and being able to do what Paul said, Colossians 1.27, present them to Christ. Christ will ask you, what did you do about your chairman? Why did you, what did you do about your colleagues? You were one of the twelve directors or you were the only Christian. What did you do about that? Those are the questions Christ will ask. Uh, I'm not sure whether Christ will ask how much tithes did you give you to church. He may or may not. But he will certainly ask about what did you do with the souls with whom you only had contact as a Christian. So we have to pitch this with people. Uh, pitch it uh, non-offensively. Pitch it attractively. 
but we have to tell them this is God's business. What you have been doing is your own business. Okay, thank you, doctor. Yes, am I to go on with the? Yeah, you can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's almost nine thirty. Uh, ten. I mean, ah, uh, 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 no, no, I got it wrong. We 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 have uh, uh, half an hour more, isn't it? We got another uh, five more minutes for uh -huh. you know for the fifteen minutes break. Ah, right, right. Uh, let me introduce this then. Uh, so this is a new area to look at, eschatology and spiritual warfare. We finished Royal Scepter, eschatology and spiritual warfare. Uh, so I take this from Revelation chapter 6. Uh, the symbolism of Revelation chapter 6 is what John saw. And John saw it as written on scrolls or a scroll. Every time he breaks a seal, another part of the scroll comes into view. So these scrolls must be long scrolls. These scrolls must be long records of what's going to happen in the world scenario, described in apocalyptic language, but not too difficult to understand. So John sees a white horse having influence over people and uh, its weapon tells us what this horse is about. So the white horse is uh, having a bow in his hand, arrows are not seen. So one would think he's using the bow, arrows are invisible. So I, I call it mindsets. He's going warring with ideologies uh, and ideologies always flooded the world from the time of Gnostic uh, thinking in John's time, uh, in, in the time of John the Apostle. Every century there were ideologies, but you can see from 19th century onwards, there were ideologies that ran around the world. Sigmund Freud's sexual thinking, Karl Marx wrote his Das Kapital in 1859, and Charles Darwin published his Origin of Species in 1859. What an agreement from hell, isn't it? Uh, how did they do this at the same time? Uh, Darwin wanted to speak to Karl Marx, but actually Karl Marx didn't want to contact Darwin. Uh, so these ideologies, then came the uh, modernist theology, liberal theology. Actually, the scientists of Darwin's day opposed him completely saying they not science, they nonsense. But the theologians of Darwin's day accepted Darwin and they readjusted their theology about infallibility of scriptures, inspiration of scriptures. Then existential philosophy came, Rudolf Bultmann came. Uh, so uh, theologians capitulated and gave up on the inerrancy of scriptures and began to teach evolution. That's how the church lost. Though all the pioneer scientists of the 19th century, Louis Pasteur, Michael Faraday, Robert Boyle, they were outstanding Christians, Alexander Fleming, all scientific innovations of the 19th century came through Christians. But Christianity lost out in the public domain with the philosophies taking over. So white horse, I would say, is uh, arrows being shot into the mindsets. Those arrows are still going on. Uh, Black Lives Matter, secular humanism, new age thinking, uh, all that. And whether you include, uh, whether you include uh, false prophets and deviations of Christianity. So you will see that while this was said by John, the Lord Jesus Christ on Mount of Olives in his last discourse, he also said false Christs and false prophets will come. He said they will try to deceive even the very elect. And he said when the time of travail begins, Matthew 24, 8, uh, many Christians will be offended. 
Many Christians will be deceived because of false prophets. Many Christians, the love of love will wax cold because of iniquity. And he that endures to the end shall be saved. So this is the Baitha's activity. All the ages, but rapidly galloping in our day. Then the red horse has a broad sword. So that must be having to do with the political realm. Sword has to do with political realm. And everywhere, every time Book of Revelation talks about beasts, we remember Daniel's visions of the Babylonian Empire looking like the lion, the uh, Persian Empire looking like the bear, the Greek Empire looking like the leopard. Then comes then the Roman Empire having the features of all four. And then Revelation 13 beast looking a monster that has all the features of all the empires that have gone on, which would be the last political kingdom of Antichrist. So the red horse, whether the red has to do with communism, I don't know, some people have thought so. But definitely the red horse is political activity that is murderous, bloodshedding, anti-Christian, that has been there from the Roman Empire. Uh, so nation shall rise against nation, ethnos against ethnos, uh, wicked rulers uh, who are global planners who plan pandemics to take over the world. All that is part of the red horse political activity. Next horse is black. Uh, he, uh, the rider has a pair of scales in his hands. So obviously it has to do with mammon and economics, trade and consumerism. And, uh, you know, the demand has been driven by Keynesian economics and we have gone on consuming. And that black horse thing is that grain becomes scarce. Poor man's food becomes very difficult. Uh, so in, uh, let's say in 1960, 60% was owned by 40%. Coming down to uh, 2010, 1% and coming down to uh, 2020, 0.01% is owning 99.99 of the world's turnover with the global brands and so on. So mammon activity, black horse activity is about unjust trade. Uh, unequal distribution. Uh, then we come to pale horse. Then of course mammon also increases all kinds of physical activity, pedophilia, commercial sex, the whole gamut of living for the body kind of philosophy and consumerism. Then uh, pale horse, the fourth horse, the the, the, nothing is said about the rider. What is said is, death and Hades follows the rider. So pale horse is the ashen color of death. And uh, the death is caused by beasts, demons, spook, black magic, famine, pestilence. So we have pestilence being planned in our day. There were pestilences always. But in our day, we have medically planned pestilences coming. And if you want to know more, uh, RNA virus vaccines uh, uh, diminishes our immunity and makes us prone to uh, immune problems. So all of the COVID deaths were most in the countries where they took flu shots. So annual flu shots actually diminish immunity for more flu and more infection. So that's a little medical medical thing. But anyway, pale horse includes all these activities. Uh, so we have a battle on our hands. But as I said, it's not, this is spiritual warfare. But we know from Ephesians 6, uh, our, our warfare is not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and wickedness and spiritual armies in heavenly places. Our warfare is with them. We know that. 
But how do we get into that? With the whole armor of God. Breastplate of our righteousness, so keeping our life blood washed. Helmet of salvation, not only for our thinking, giving as many people as possibly we can salvation. And our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So evangelism is the main method of spiritual warfare. Winning one soul to Christ stops darkness and begins light. So intercession without evangelism is no go. Evangelism without intercession, people will not get saved. So the two have to go together. So we must agree to the plot as our commander-in-chief gave. Winning one soul to Christ transforms the nation. And if that soul happens to be a chairman of a large conglomerate, all his business practices can change. If we pastor, disciple that person, uh, through the nitty-gritty details of what exactly the blood of Jesus Christ will do. Uh, yeah. So this is a large picture of the horses, but getting down to the nitty-gritty details of pastoring, the whole armor of God, belt of truth, a shield of faith, quenching fiery darts, that is a very personal activity, uh, daily happening, so don't shift the spiritual warfare to second heavens and upstairs and esoteric and doing planned prayer marches. Okay, you may, but every day walking the talk is more important than planned prayer marches around uh, temples and religious places. It's far more important to get one soul saved at a time, praying, interceding, meeting up, kindly act, care act, uh, watch, visit them in hospital, visit them in their trouble, boil down all of your spiritual warfare effort to saving one soul at a time is my insistent advice to our own congregants. If you can put all your weight and effort to win your cousin, brother, sister, father, mother, husband, and then your boss, your colleagues, uh, all the time we go to work any day to win souls to Christ. In the tube, in the monorail, uh, give a lift uh, as you enter the office, have a plan, today I must find five minutes, today lunchtime I'm going to have my lunch with that person for whom I want to bring to Christ. So th this is the purpose of our existence. So however knowledgeable we are about Revelation chapter 6, it plays out day by day in having my feet shod with the gospel of peace, witnessing to one person at a time. Uh, may I move on to the next one? Still, uh, we can have a break. Okay, we'll have a break. Thank you, Doctor. We have God a 15 minutes break. Yes. We'll be back at 11.15.